Hey, and welcome everyone who had been enjoying the Orboot and Rust hacking sessions so far. And here we are starting a new episode, uh, well, a, a new whole season uh, of the season, uh, se series on hacking on Orboot. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not too well prepared today. And as you can see, I'm actually in a bit of a different space now. So uh, below me, you actually see the logo of the place where I'm at. This is the hackerspace here in Essen, the city where I live. And so, yeah, we have some uh, slightly different equipment here than what I have back at home. And maybe we will even have some collaborative hacking streams here uh, with somebody else joining me here in the hackerspace. Yeah, unfortunately not yet today, uh, but anyway, we're just getting started. So in the previous season, we were looking at an interesting development board, uh, which is featuring a uh, Risk Five SOC. Risk Five being the instruction set and SOC a system on chip, and that was the JH seven one hundred by uh, Star Five, and Star Five made the Vision Five board, uh, which was the board that we were using. And now we're switching over to another board, uh, which is a bit more recent, and that would be the M one S Doc by Cyped, and well, Doc just means that we have. Uh, what we see here in the picture, uh, we have this breakout board around the M1S module. So if you look at this module here, let's zoom in a bit, you see it says M1S and that is really just this module up here with the metal shield on it and the uh, antenna up here. So yeah, everything around it makes it the dock. Um, yeah, it's a common naming pattern uh, with Type-P. They also called other uh, boards uh, a dock where you know you you would essentially just uh, plug in something else in a sense, uh, and here the module is just soldered onto the board. So far, uh, we haven't really done too much yet with this, uh, but we did in the end of the previous season uh, try to get started with printing to the UART on that board. So the UART would be like a serial output thing, and that is uh, what I've just. Um, well read up on over the last uh, few weeks and uh, improved the implementation thereof. So let's actually have a look now at the code that we have so far. And if you've watched the uh, previous streams, you may recognize some things, but it might actually look somewhat different. So here we are back in our editor, uh, so up here. And what we are seeing here is the main source code. So. Uh, up, up here, we mostly have just some imports and a few constants defined. So what makes sense here is like the name of the SOC. This is the Buffalo Lab BL808. So yeah, that is uh, the name of the chip itself, which is, you know, under the metal shield on the module that you just saw. And well, we got the board name, Cypeed M1S doc. And to be honest, I'm not too sure yet if we should stick with uppercase or lowercase s. I'm not sticking with uppercase s. It's uh, you know, spelled like this or like that on different websites for whatever reasons. Um, anyway, so let's stick with that for now. Uh, how do we begin the code? So this here is for risk five. So we need to have the few first risk five instructions here. And we do that in assembly. So we just do these very, very few simple instructions. The first ones being uh, essentially disabling uh, all the interrupts that are there. Um, clearing the M status register, that is the machine status register. And then uh, we clean up some environmental uh, things. So uh, we we clear uh, the stack and everything around it and the BSS segment. Um, and well, then we uh, just jump to our main function. That is this instruction here. And when we're done with our code, um, well, so far we're just resetting the platform here. Um, but because uh, the current implementation is actually ending in a loop, we would never get there. So yeah, it doesn't really matter too much anyway. So let's scroll down to the main function first. And uh, this is it. It's actually very, very simple and small. And as you can see, I put up some uh, comments here. And let me now quickly read a few things. So uh, let, let's first zoom in a bit because I think it's otherwise a bit hard to read on the recording. Um, so what I've written here is, uh, there are multiple UARTs available, in fact. So this SOC uh, actually features four UARTs, out of which we don't need to use, you know, <laughs> all of them uh, at the same time, of course. So we just start with two of them. So um, 
yeah this is actually a bit um this is a bit misleading so yeah i actually just uh, find, found the first erratum uh we configure the first two uh to 115 200 bots so yeah this is the transfer speed um so how does that work uh well we need to have some setup code and more on that later in a bit um just a note on why we actually do set up two of them so we can use one for you know just some very very simple debug output and the other one for uh, more meaningful logging and then over time we can adjust just at some point we can discard the first one you know and just uh, stick with the second one and then we can actually free the first one and give it to another environment at some point because here's the thing um, this SOC actually features multiple different cores so it's a heterogeneous system and what that means is the specific cores that we have, they are different. So one of them in this case here is a 32-bit core. That's the one we are currently uh, writing this code here for. And then there is another one, a 64-bit core. And that 64-bit core is much, much more capable, as you can imagine. And it's actually something for which we already have a more or less complete Linux port. So uh, the core is the uh, C906. So the 64-bit uh, core is a C906. Uh, that's a core from T-Hat, the semiconductor daughter of uh, Alibaba. And this core is the same that you also find on a different board from Saipid, and that is featuring the D1 SOC, uh, D1 being made by Allwinner, uh, just you know an another chip vendor. So yeah, as, as you can already see, uh, those cores are actually being used in different chips. So it's a bit like in the ARM world, except that, uh, you know, with ARM, there is essentially one company making all the cores. And then, you know, they give out licenses to everyone who would actually like to make a product out of it, you know, design their own chips. But in this case here, uh, because RISC-V is actually an openly uh, an open instruction set with a license you know that allows anyone to just design their own chip um, you are much much more flexible and you find chips from uh, and, and cores from lots of different vendors and the c906 specifically is even an open core so it's very very interesting now uh coming back to this year let's actually see what happens here in this uh main function so what what do we do uh we use a so-called pack. So we, we discussed this also in the previous season. A pack is something uh, defined by the Rust Embedded Working Group. And what it's short for is just peripheral access crate. So it's a crate that is, uh, you know, how we um, modularize code in Rust. So a crate is essentially, you know, uh, one, you, you can think of one module. And in this case here, it's just a very specific kind of module so that is not like something specific from from us but it's really just you know the thing that is implemented it's just the domain of um the rust embedded working group essentially so they define pack to be a crate that gives you access to the peripherals just like the name suggests and how this works is from the pack you get something which is just called peripherals here and so the first thing you do when you work with a pack is you take the peripherals and then you store them in a variable and from there on you would just propagate everything down to well all the other functions you're going to write you know and different uh, other crates maybe that you come up with and so on and then what you would typically do on top of that would be implementing drivers and for implementing drivers we have the traits which are coming from the also from the Rust Embedded Working Group, and that would be Embedded Hell. So Embedded Hell is an, another crate, so this is coming from the Rust Embedded Working Group themselves, and that essentially you know, abstracts away all the peripherals uh, you, you can imagine, like all the basic ones, like a UART, for example, something we use here as well, uh, and they also uh, provide something like uh, SPI, for example, the Serial Peripheral Interface, and so on. So if, if you're curious, just search for Embedded Hell uh, in Rust or switch back to our previous episodes here from the previous season. So let's see what we actually do here now specifically. Uh, first of all, 
we take one thing out of the peripherals now, which is called GLB. A GLB here, now this is specific to the SOC, that is for the global configuration on the 32-bit core, or let's rather say on the bus that surrounds the 32-bit core, because technically you could also access that from the 64-bit core at some point, but we're not there yet. So this is how we start. And we pass this on to a function that is called GPIO UART init. And uh, what this function does is it takes the GLB, so the thing that we pass on here, and then it configures some general purpose input output pins, GPIO pins, so that they can function as a UART. So UART for, you know, uh, it's like a uh, universal asynchronous receiver, transceiver, something. Essentially the hardware part that is for the serial. And well, when we're done initializing it, uh, then we do another init here. And here you can see this is now where we instantiate the serial. So the thing is, the GPA opens are very, very flexible. So we do not want to pass them down to the serial driver, you know, but we may actually want to use them for something else again. But there is something that we do pass down to the serial driver now, and we can no longer take it back out again. And that is the two UARTs that we get here, UART0 and UART1. Now what this means is we can no longer access those directly anymore and we don't even have to. We would just use them through our logger here. And so what we do is we pass on the serial that we just instantiated to our logger. So this is what we have this function set logger for. And now we can just happily use the uh, log crate that we have here for, uh, you know, just printing to the UART. And there is one thing um, that we can do here now with the UART zero. And there is a function that I made, which is called just debug, but I, you know, put an underscore here. So, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, signaling to people that, you know, we might actually drop this at some point. It, it's not really made for, you know, being there forever, but just for some initial debugging now. Well, and now for the second UART, I print, I created the print macro. So I can now use print LN or also just print if I so want it. And now I can actually, uh, you know, print an entire string. So this one here is really just for one 8-bit number. So it's just numbers from 0 to 255. And this can now be anything, like any, any sort of text. So we can also print emoji, like the crab emoji or the turtle emoji down here. Now the question is, how does that actually work? How did we implement this? So now let's walk through step by step. Let's first look at this here, where we now initialize the GPIO pin so that they function as a UART. So let's actually go to the definition of that function. And so it starts with the signature where you know we pass the GLB. And now what we do is, and this is now uh, you know the thing that is coming from uh, the Rust embedded world, instead of just, you know, using the uh, simple write volatile function to write to registers directly, what we do is we use semantic functions. And so what you see here is the first function that we use, it's called GLB GPIO config dot write. Now GPIO config, that is actually, uh, you know, an array of all the GPIO pins. So in this case here, I am taking GPIO pin 14. And now I'm writing to that pin. And what I'm saying is, I'm giving it the alternate function and I tell it to be a UART. And once I'm done with that, well, I also tell it to be the output pin. So this is uh, something that needs a twofold step. So first I say output set and then set bit. It's a, maybe a bit counterintuitive, but that's uh, typical with these functions. So you. Usually you, you have like, you know, this, this two step pattern here. So first one function and then the other function. So it's often like, you know, like in this case here, the bit that you want to set and then the action. So you could also clear the bit, for example. So if I wanted to say it's, it's not actually uh, an output pin, I would say clear bit. But yeah, in this case, we just uh, set the bit. Now in a similar fashion, 
uh, for the next GPA open, that is GPA open 15. We're also setting it to be a UART here. We say uh, alternate and then UART, but then we say we use the input function. Again, we need to set the bit for it. And also we set up a pull up. So we also set the bit here. Now currently, in fact, we're actually not really using this, so we might uh, as well discard this for now. Um, but yeah, we, we may actually, uh, uh, or that is at least my intention, uh, we will probably just write a very teeny tiny operating system, you know, just for testing this out, like, you know, maybe it can read some input and then just, you know, just uh, do some very simple timer things like, you know, do a timeout and uh, you, know, you know, when when an interrupt is triggered, then continue with something like, I don't know, every every once in a while, maybe print something stupid or whatever. Um, yeah, nothing too fancy, nothing too interesting at this point. Uh, you know, this is really just the setup anyway. So let's continue with the code. What we're doing here is, well, the same setup with two other pins. Um, so that we now have two pairs of pins that we can use both for UARTs. And now comes the tricky part. So on this SOC now, when you say you want to use a GPIO for UART, um, well, you, you already see this here. This is very generic. Now we need to actually tell it which UART we want to use. And that is through this thing here, uh, which is called function and then some number. And that is in the UART signal register. There is UART signal uh, 0 and also UART signal 1. So you can uh, configure uh, a bunch of pins actually uh, for, you know, uh, being UART. There's four UARTs anyway, right? So <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and what we're doing specifically here is we're saying function 2 and then UART 0 TX. So TX is for the transmission. And now in a similar fashion, we say function 3 you are zero rx so rx for, is for receival and now the question is well how, how do you now know which of these is uh which of those down here like you know what what do two three four and five actually mean and that is something that is really all but intuitive to be honest and i was really struggling with getting this right and I actually failed doing that in the previous stream, you know, where, uh, you know, I just drafted around a bit and tried to set this up. So in an intermediate step, if you look at the Git history here, you will actually see that I did something uh, just uh, based on using the write and read volatile functions. Um, and then I rewrote this to this here because I wanted to, you know, get an understanding of everything first. Now we'll show you how to actually read the uh, manual to figure this here out. So let's actually have a look at the manual. Uh, let me just pull this over here. So what we have here is, uh, well, this is currently uh, the wrong thing to look at anyway. Uh, here, we need to look at this here. And this is the, do we get the full title? Uh, BL808 Datasheet 1.2. The other one, uh, this here, is the RM, the reference manual. So. Yeah, you actually need both of them sort of to, you know, have the full manual. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit weird, but that's what it is. So yeah, we looked at this year also in the previous stream. I don't want to dive too much into this year anyway, um, but actually look at the configuration. We also looked at that, but um, I didn't really fully grasp it. So let's now have a look at that again. Um, we're going to search for here, uh, peripheral. Um, here with you are, uh, huh, hang on a second. I think I'm actually mixing up the uh, documents again. Yeah, that, that's a bit annoying. Um, hang on a second. Is this your system architecture? Uh, I think this year is actually the right document. GPIO overview features, input settings. Um, hang on. Now it was actually in the right document. Yeah. Okay. Hang on a second. We, we will need to find that section again. So there is one section here, right? Uh, this is where all the pins are described with all the different functionalities. And as you can see here, it's actually rather complex. So what we see here, 
which is covering an entire page in the manual, is just for configuring one single GPIO pin. And because you cannot actually uh, read anything like this now, <laughs> I will first zoom in. So we need to look at these two columns here first. So they are the uh, main ones to look at. The first one is the so-called GPIO function select number. And the second one is the peripheral internal function select. And this works in a twofold uh, manner as follows. So there are some GPIO functions where you only need to actually select the first column. So you see the second column, you know, uh, there is nothing in here, right? It just says minus here. So what this means is if you set the function to, let's say two, now you can actually look through the columns and try to figure out what this means. Well, in this case here, it actually doesn't really do anything when you set this to two. So that is actually undefined. Now, in turn, if we look at one here, what happens if we set it to one? Well, it's the SPI MOSI pin. So MOSI is like, uh, I think this is like for, for input on the SPI thing. Um, so yeah, but that, or it could also be output. I'm, I'm never sure how to read this, to be honest. So this O here is for output and this here is for input. And I'm never sure which one is which side. Uh, I think this is actually for outputting from our side and you know on the other side it would then be input. Whatever. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much now. So what we're interested in anyway is this here, 7, and here it says UART. And now you see this abbreviation where it says UART SIG, and uh, that is for signal, 9, select equals 0 or 1 or 2, 3, 4, and so on. And those in turn translate to this column here. So now if you set the first thing to 7 and now the second to some other number, then this column here applies. Okay. So this sig or signal thing here is actually something that we just saw in the code. And let's have a quick look at that again. This here, UART signal 0. This register is what that refers to. And this is where in one register, you actually now define uh, for multiple pins what they are supposed to do. So what you see in this column here is exactly that. And when it says here, function 02, then it would actually refer to UART SIG2 here. So we need to look at something else now. And how do we actually know which GPIO pin we look at? So we're currently looking at GPIO pin 45. In the previous stream, I was confusing it. I was looking at this column here, but that was actually the wrong column. Now, how do we actually know which GPIO pins we need to use? So um, if, if we look at the website again, and I'm sorry for jumping around too much, but it's, you know, it is what it is. So down here, it says UART, right? And this here is actually USB port that is coming from this chip. And this chip is not actually the chip that we're talking to eventually, but it is connected and hardwired to the BL808 chip that is underneath here. So now some pins are just wired to this chip. This chip turns uh, those uh, pins from there into a USB interface, and that is how we can now access the UART, right? So otherwise we would need to have a, a converter. Like there are also some pins which are directly exposed down here. So those four pins of those, the first two, R and T, uh, they suggest receive and transmit. They are also wired to some of the GPIOs uh, in here. I, I don't know currently which of those uh, they are, um, but we could use them for any purpose, actually. So we wouldn't need to have to use it for a UART. We could also do something else with it, whatever we want. I mean, one typical application would be that you just connect something here and then, you know, it goes to some other part and then you would connect to uh, and talk to some other chips through a UART again, right? So you could do that. But you could also connect some LEDs, for example, and, you know, just flash the LEDs, for example. And, well... 
on this board here, we actually do have an LED, and that LED is this here. We can also use this LED and make it light up and, you know, give it different uh, brightnesses. Anyway, so back to our code again. Um, so, or, well, no, let's actually go back to the PDF again, and now we need to look at something else. So now the question still is, which pins uh, do end up down here on the UART. So, uh, in other words, which pins are connected up here? So, how do we figure this out? Uh, we need to look at the schematic, and the schematic is right here. So, here you see the metal shield and the module itself. Uh, it's not labeled here, but it doesn't really matter. And here you see it on the board, and now there is it's actually the same picture that we saw on the website. So down here we have the UART, here we have the chip, and now up here we have the um, pinouts. And now this year, this year is what goes to the second chip from our BL808. And here you can see it actually says BL702. That is that tiny chip that I just showed you. It's also another chip from Buffalo Lab, which is, you know, just provisioned with some other firmware that, you know, makes us a uh, USB serial interface now. Now here you can see why we're actually using the GPIO pins 14, 15, 16, and 17, because those are exactly the pins that are connected here. All right, and with that, let's go back to our code again. So now we're here at function 02, and the question is now, how do we know which of those functions go to which of those pins? Um, and we have to switch again now. I'm, I'm very sorry. So we need to look at the data sheet again. So now we need to look for pad GPIO 14. And let's scroll down a bit to find that. Uh, I mean, we can also just search, right? Pad GPIO 14. And here we go. And now if you look at this here, let me zoom out again. Uh, it's actually the, the same sort of thing that we saw earlier. Um, and now if you look at this column, you see GPIO pin 14 corresponds to UART signal 2. And UART signal 2 in turn is the function 2 thing that we have in our code. And now if we want this to be the UART 0 TX, well, now that we have a semantic function, we just tell it to be that. So we just say UART0TX. And now you see, okay, function two, this actually relates to pin 14. And that connection is made right here, where we have 14 here and signal two there. Now, how about the other pins? Um, we're actually just following along with the same pattern. So this here is GPIO pin 15. And here you can see pin 15 is wired up to signal 3. So now for function 3, it would say this here is now the RX pin for UART0. So in our code, we're doing exactly that. We're saying UART0, RX, D, whatever. Um, yeah, the, just ignore the D here. So yeah, this is just for uh, receiving. Well, and the same for those two here, I mean, you can just believe me now or look at the sheet again. I you know, don't want to look at each and every one of those again and again. Anyway, so with that done, now the final step for the setup here is this here. And there is another register for configuring the UART where we need to enable the clock for it. Simple as that. It's just one bit in this register. So we say clock enable. And once again, we say set bit. And now let's go back again to our main function where we came from. So now that we did the GPIO UART init, let's look at how we instantiate the serial now. So to the serial, we pass on two things that we also got from the peripherals here, and those are UART0 and UART1. So we pass them on to uh, this here. So this year now implements the serial. And as you can see, it's actually parameterized. So those are generics that we pass on. And we're saying that we're expecting a UART0 and a UART1. It's not exactly elegant now. It looks a bit very redundant, right? So we also have UART0 and UART1 here. 
it is just what it is currently with the rest language or at least i haven't figured out any better way so far uh, we actually have this code also in a uh, in another implementation in our book currently so i'm currently just uh, following this pattern if anyone actually knows any better uh, do let us know and let's see if we can uh, make something nicer out of that that would be really great so yeah um so how does this work anyway so here now we need to do another step for initializing uh, what we do here is currently just we configure the transmit register so for each uart so each uart is actually uh, the same here so you are zero and you are one, they behave just like, you know, the same thing, except that they are at different memory addresses. So if you, if you uh, think of the map that we have in memory, then you can imagine there is one you are sitting here, one you are sitting there, right? And those uh, two regions in memory, uh, they are so-called register blocks. So one, one of those regions in memory you know, it's, it's just a set of registers that we can now talk to and configure. And we're doing it through the means of our Rust embedded things here again. So this U0 here is the thing that we took from the peripherals, right? So we took the peripherals and now we're passing on U0 here. U0 is just UR0. Uh, I abbreviated it because it's just for this short function here anyway and otherwise only use internally for like two more functions and we will look at that again so we configure the transmit register for its word length so the word length is um you know how how long one word is on the wire actually it, it sounds a bit stupid but uh you actually need to configure this so we, we just use the common one we use eight bits for a word so that is also what most people know from like eight bits are a byte but, um, well, that's actually not uh, entirely true. It's just, in our case, it's 8 bits being one byte, and, well, we're okay with that. And with that, we can later then, you know, just use our serial and, you know, print our emoji and so on. Um, now there is uh, two more things. Uh, the stop bits, so the stop bits is configured to 1. That is a very, very common thing to set up. And then there is this here, the free run mode and the function able well we would need to do function able anyway in order to use this uh, but the free run mode now means we can just put things into the uart all the time um, otherwise if, if we don't configure it to be the free run mode uh, that, that is really just specific to this part again here um, then you know we we couldn't uh, we couldn't just uh, give it uh, each and every byte. We would need to like set something up again, and something gets cleared again. We need to set something up again. It's it's a bit weird. So yeah, we we just use the free run mode here. It just means you can use the UART all the time. Now, it might be that you know for a power saving environment, for example, you might not want to have this. So you know you might <laughs> actually want to configure it not to be the free run mode. But yeah, anyway, we do this for both of the UART. So you can see the two functions uh, are being called with a, you know, the same uh, things here. So now the um, next step that we do is this year, uh, we get the bit period and the bit period is what configures the baud rate. So the baud rate is essentially the transfer speed that we use. So down here, you can see I already prepared a command uh, using picocom. And I'm saying I want to have 115 200 bots. And that is what the first UART initially starts anyway, uh, when we just reset the board and then we use the, uh, you know, the protocol on the chip to talk to it. And, uh, you know, then uh, load our firmware and then it would be executed. So what I just do here is I read out this period from U0 uh, well, it, it's split up into two parts. It's the receive and the transmit bits. And then I'll write it actually back to uh, the other UART again. Yeah, we wouldn't have to do it this way. Uh, we could do it maybe a bit more elegant. It doesn't matter too much. Now let's do one thing here I haven't actually done yet. And um, that is in part because I haven't configured my editor for it yet. Uh, let's actually get some indentation here uh, to make this a bit more readable. Um, this is rather trivial anyway, but uh, yeah. Okay, we, we can get rid of that thing. And here we go. 
So yeah, I, I just do this here, uh, you know, for each and every uh, function and uh, or, or functionality of register or, you know, it's it's usually a group of bits. And then the value we gave uh, give it, I, I just put that in one line usually, then the next one, then the next one, and the next one. The rest formatter uh, may think otherwise, um, but, you know, here, here in our context, it actually makes a lot of sense. So we may configure uh, the formatter for uh, being happy with this. Um, yeah, I haven't done that yet here, but it doesn't really matter too much currently. Um, now we do this here. Uh, we're passing on u0 and u1 uh, to our own self. So that means we can now use it also in other functions that we have. And now let's have a look at this one here, the debug function. Not debug with an underscore yet, but just the debug function. Now this is what we can use to write to the first UART's data register. So this is for getting output. And we just give it a number. And the number, we just expect a U8. So that is why I told you earlier, like something from 0 to uh, 255. Um, and then we print that. Well, the API expects this to be a 32-bit value because it's a 32-bit register. But effectively, it actually drops. Uh, sorry, it actually drops the upper bit. So we just end up with the last eight bits in this register anyway. And maybe, maybe we can actually use a different function instead of bits here. So let's see what else we can uh, we can use. Oh look, we can also say value and then say num here. Uh, well, it says exp Back, oh, right, 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 right. So we need to say value first, and then is it variant? Variant is a bit weird at this point. Bits, huh. Let's go with variant, and then we say num. Does that work? Does it look happy? It does. And now we can actually get rid of the unsafe part. So when you write raw bits to something, um, that is something the uh, pack rate allows for. But that may mean that you, uh, you know, would write something um, and that was actually not really uh, meant for being written. Uh, so yeah, you know, some registers uh, have their constraints, uh, but the hardware, you know, would actually accept some things. It might be resilient to something malformed or not. So yeah, the Rust crate here uh, is essentially, um, you know, keeping you from, from doing something uh, horribly wrong. So yeah, by just saying, okay, if you want to write custom bits just like that, you actually need to specifically say unsafe here. So yeah, let's actually look at the uh, same thing down here. So instead, of doing this here, where we're doing the same thing, we could also just say, sorry, uh, value, and then a variant. And now we just put in C here. And now we can get rid of another unsafe block again. Nice. So what are we looking at here? Now, this here is the implementation of one trait, which is coming from embedded hell. So up here, you see embedded hell. We implement the serial trait and specifically the non-blocking version of it. And at this point here, we implement the writer interface. So, you know, for just printing output, currently we're not implementing input. That is okay, so we don't have read. This here is just right. And for doing so, you need to implement two functions. One of them, well, is the write function, this one here. The second one is the flush function, that one here, um, which is currently, as you can see, not really doing anything. And I'm not sure if we actually ever need this, so we may as well just always say, okay. Uh, we're, we're here in the space of firmware anyway, and you know, mostly we would just print some debug output there is no like performance that we would need to have here or anything, right? So, and usually if you pass on to an operating system, you want your firmware to get out of your way anyway, right? So yeah, this is not really uh, meant to be forever. 
So yeah, at some point we may just put OK here and be happy. So anyway, how does this printing work now? So you can see there is one thing I'm reading first here, and that is called bus state. And the bus state register of the UART is what tells you whether it is currently busy transmitting. So we're saying dot read, and now we're taking out one bit, which is the transmit busy bit, and we're checking whether it is actually busy. If it is busy, well, we would say, well, at, at this point, we, we would be blocked from writing. And well, this is what this uh, non-blocking uh, variant of the trait here is giving us. Uh, you know, other, otherwise, we would need to express this uh, a bit differently. So it would just be spinning and spinning a bit here. And then it would try again and again until we're no longer busy. And then we can do this here. Uh, the same as we saw before for the debug function, we just do the data write. We say value and variant. And well, the C here, well, it's just for the character that we're currently printing. And that is not even correct in every context because the emoji characters, for example, there are actually multiple times a U8 here. Anyway, so this is how the underlying implementation basically works. And now let's go back to our code again. Uh, well, the main function and the main function, sorry, just jumped around too much. Uh, the main function then continues with passing on the serial to the logger. Now, what does the logger do? Well, the logger now provides us with the macros for printing so that we can say print ln. It also gives us a raw function down here called debug. Technically, there is also a function that would, you know, use um, that is used internally for uh, doing what we see here. So this is really just a simplification. Now let's look at the logger. So when we say logger, we just pass the instance of that zero we just did in the previous line, right? And uh, how does that work now? So this here, let's scroll down a bit. So up here is a bit boilerplate code again. Uh, that is also a rest thing for uh, something. It doesn't really matter at this point too much. Um, now we have this function here, which is called set logger. And now we have something global in this uh, file here, which is called logger, uppercase logger. And that means that we can now access this from anywhere else, like here, for example, and down here. And as you can see, those are loose functions. They are not actually you know, in a specific relationship, like, you know, when we implement a trade, for example, or, you know, um, like, it would otherwise look a bit like, you know, like an object oriented programming, if you uh, think of the serial thing again. So that's not what we, want, what we want to do here. Here, we just want to use a global thing. And why want we, uh, we actually want to do that? Well, we want to do that so that we don't need to pass things around all the time, right? So, in general, you would want to avoid having global objects floating around, right? Because that is very much prone to error. But in this case here, we actually want this to be accessible from anywhere just because we want to use the print macro, right? So imagine otherwise, if you have multiple files, now you would need to pass around something all the time just so that you could print to the UART. That would just drive you nuts. So we do this here. Now, when this says set logger, um, well, we, we do this here. There is something called inner here, and uh, that is now getting the serial. Uh, that is wrapped again in another struct, which is the boilerplate code I uh, mentioned before. And now let's actually have a look at where logger is defined. So logger is defined here. We're saying uh, this is a static mute. It's public, so we can also access it from uh, other places. We initialize it to be none, and in the function that we just saw, you know, we then uh, switch that none out for what we actually want it to be, namely our zero that we just instantiated. And what does that look like? So the type of this thing is actually an option for logger. So option means it can be either none or this here, which is the specific 
uh, for uh, the option. So option is something that expects uh, an annotation for a generic. And we're saying it has to be a logger. Uh, what is logger again? Well, logger is this here, which has something called inner. And this is why we could just say uh, down there, um, we, we could just say uh, logger equals some logger. And then we say inner is wrapping our serial, right? So yeah, um, with all of that set up, now let's look at a few more things. So the first thing I want to look at uh, is down here, the debug function. So the debug function is just as simple as you may imagine. Now we just check if our global logger here is actually set. So we say if let sum, it sounds a bit strange, but you know, that's just the syntax here in Rust now. And what this means is, if our logger is set, so if it's not none, but it's an actual instance of a logger. Now we store it in this variable called L. And that is now available here in this scope in those curly braces. And now we can say L dot inner. Well, we have to say dot zero dot debug. And this is now our serial interface. So this is the debug function that we saw uh, earlier when uh, we looked at the previous code. So when I go to the definition for this here, uh, can I get to the definition of this? Yes. Now we end up at this function exactly here, right? So the thing that we looked at earlier, and we just rewrote a bit. All right. That's the debug function. Now there's another one, the print function. It also starts with an underscore signaling that it's not actually really meant for external use because instead we want to actually be able to use our print macros. Now, what does the print function do? Now, this is a bit fancier. First of all, you can see here we're using format write. So format is coming from the Rust core library. And that is another trait again. Well, and what this now gives us is some functions and that is for, you know, just writing to some output. And that is now actually completely decoupled from a UART in specifics. It could also be something else, like something that is writing to somewhere in memory. Well, that is also how we talk to the UART. But, it, you know, you can imagine, like, if you just have some RAM somewhere, you know, you, you just allocate some memory, let's say, like, four kilobytes. And now you just write into those four kilobytes whatever message you want, right? So, yeah, this is what we have here. And there are many uh, languages which also call this uh, the, this sort of thing a writer interface, right? So it's an interface just for writing out data. And in a similar fashion, there would be reader interfaces and so on. Now, what do we do here? Well, we actually call a function which is, which is called write FMT, and we pass on arguments. And those arguments are FMT arguments. Now, FMT, or format, again, coming from the Rust core library. These are formatted strings. So you can think of like, um, you, know, you, you want to print something, uh, which includes some additional input. And you know, th that is where it gets fancy already, right? So you, you don't just print some some static value, but you actually want to have some variables in there. So th that is called uh, string formatting, essentially. So you, you know, you would define a string, and then give it some additional data. We can look at a, an example in a bit. Let's continue first. So this print thing here is never used directly, actually. Uh, we only use it through those two macros down here. One of them is println, and the other one is print. Now, they're roughly the same. What does print actually do? Well, it takes the formatted arguments and then puts them into the print function up here. Now, this here looks a bit fancy. This is because it's now a macro definition. I don't want to dive too much into macro definitions right now. And to be honest, I don't understand that part yet myself. Um, I just copied that from somewhere else again, uh, essentially our own code. And well, you would actually see the very same code being implemented for each and every other SOC, which is doing the very same thing. Now, down here, you see 
that we're doing almost the same thing. Now the only difference is we also print these two extra characters, backslash R and backslash N. That is a carriage return and a line feed. So essentially that just means a line break. Well, and we now just do this very simple decision. If we don't get any arguments, like, you know, if we just call the print function itself without anything, uh, well, the print ln, then we just print that line break by itself, right? Anyway, so it's as, th as simple as you can imagine, but now let's look at something which we just skipped sort of intentionally, and uh, that is this here. Now you see something here which is called write stir or write string, and if we search for this, that is actually never used again here, uh, but something that we did was we say write FMT. So write FMT or write format, that is now coming from here, right? So from FMT, the, the right thing here. And what we're doing here now is we're saying we implement format write for our serial. So this S here, uh, it's actually just our serial uh, in, in a sense, right? It's this inner thing here. It's also that, that serial thing, which is just wrapped up a bit, but you know, that's just some boilerplate code that, you know, as I said, doesn't really matter too much here. Now, what we need to do is for writing a string, it's also just as simple as you may imagine. We just iterate over the string, S is our string, and for each and every byte in that string, well, we just say, right. Uh, well, then we unwrap. That is also just because of the underlying implementation that we have. And now this write function here, and afterwards, you know, we would call the flush function. That is exactly what we just looked at earlier. So if we now say go to definition, well, we get back here again where we were saying we're implementing the embedded hell serial blah -de blah right for our serial, right? So this write function here, and then later being called that flush function here, is exactly those which are being called in this implementation of the write trait that we implement for our serial. Well, and that is why we can call this here. So if you look at the Rust core library, then you will see, well, write FMT underneath actually really just, you know, calls into the write stir function eventually. All right. Now, with all of that, let's actually try out our current code. So let's do two things. First, I'm connecting with picocom to the second. Uh, no, actually, um, hang on. Well, I'm connecting to the second URL. They are just a bit in a different order. So if, if you look at the argument here, it says TTY USB zero. That is what we configure to be the second URL, uh, URL one. And on the left, now this year, uh, this is the URL that by default, the um, the the loader that is coming from the Mascrom uh, is, um, this is what it's listening on and, you know, giving us a protocol so that we can talk to it. When I now run make, I pass on the port also. Uh, then we actually call into a small Python tool and that Python tool will then now load our code to the chip. So let's see what happens. We run this now. Uh, it says handshake failed. Okay, um, I guess I need to reset something. Hang on a second. Uh, of course. The demo gods don't like me today. Yeah, let me just unplug this. It might have just reset itself because it was being unplugged for a longer while. All right, I plugged in the board again and let's try it again. Huh. Once again, it failed. Why does it fail now? That is very, very weird. What does LSUSB say? Hmm. That looks okay. Oh, I have another suspicion. Huh. Oh, we do have USB 0 and USB 1. 
Hmm. Interesting. Let's try another few times. I promise you that hasn't happened like this before. Uh, huh. No, I just waited a bit and, uh, you know. That is very, very strange now. Well, let's try plugging it into a different port, actually. Um, so we, we have a few here. So uh, if you have seen the previous stream, we actually had this working. Okay. Handshake failed. Oh, now it's working. Great. Okay. Uh, now, now we just didn't see the nice output here on the right hand side. So I just reset again. I don't know what's up with it at this moment. So we just run it again. Now you see Okay, let's already reset and hold. So now you see on the left hand side here, it's printing an asterisk. And the asterisk is, well, exactly what we were printing uh, in our main function. So in our main function, we're saying 42. And if we look at the ASCII table, man ASCII, then we will see 42, well, decimal 42 down here, that is the asterisk. Okay, that is looking good. Um, let's, uh, let's actually scroll up a bit here, like this. Okay, now we see some more output. So the first thing we see printed is or boot on this side here. So this is exactly that print function here. And now we have another function which is called risk five plat info, well, for platform. What does that do? It will print the RISC-V vendor. So for RISC-V, there is a few registers describing the platform. That is the vendor, the architecture ID, and the implementation ID. It's just what they uh, called it. So as you can see up here, we're reading out those values and then just printing them. That is what we see here. So we're seeing vendor 5B7, architecture 0, implementation 0. So 5B7, or if we uh, were to look at that in hexadecimal, let's fire up our favorite calculator, being Node.js, hex 5b7, that is 1463, okay, uh, what is the bit mask for it, 5b7, anything fancy, I don't know, it is just 101, so yeah, that is just for, uh, you know, t hat essentially, so if you look at, uh, other implementations that we have in, in Orboot, the one for the D1, for example, it would also print the same thing, 5B7. Anyway, now we print two more, uh, well, three more things. We print the RISC-V heart ID. So heart is like, you know, the, the number of the core, if you will. It's, it's just called heart or hardware thread here in RISC-V. Then the board name and the SOC name. So yeah, exactly what you also see up here. Well, and then is uh, coming lots of turtles, uh, turtles all the way down, as they say. Uh, and that is just what we're printing here. So in a loop, it's just saying print line turtle, and that waits a bit, prints another turtle, and so on. You know, and that is how we actually never reach the reset that I was talking to you earlier. So yeah, um, that is where we're at currently. Now, what do we do in the next step? So. I uh, talked to Samuel Holland, who had already worked with this a bunch, and he was saying that um, in order to now run the second core, uh, we could look at his implementation in U-Boot, um, and that is, uh, you know, just based on some communication mechanism over the bus, where uh, one heart would then, like, sort of wake up the other one and tell it to run a specific code from some memory address. And um, yeah, for that, we will actually need to, to have a bit of a mechanism again. Uh, well, in, in our code also, more on that at some point later. Uh, just for reference, um, this here is now the corresponding assembly code. Uh, let me zoom in a bit. So yeah, uh, this is Samuel Holland uh, or Smail. Um, and uh, this here is currently his OpenSPI implementation. 
Sorry, maybe I mixed it up. Maybe it was here in the open. Well, this is actually open SBI. It doesn't really matter. So there is also a U-boot port he made. Um, yeah. No, it's a, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I got that wrong. So we need to look at the open SBI implementation here. That's it. So yeah, um, this is how it works. Uh, you need to set the entry point for the next core. So the other core is called D0. They also have some other names for the core, but it doesn't really matter here. Now we give it the address to continue with. Now we're using the AUIPC instruction, AUIPC. PC here is for program counter, A for add, and UI for unsigned immediate. So this is an immediate value this year that we add to the program counter. Uh, I assume it would start with zero. So yeah, we would now end up with this address. Um, I'm not exactly sure about this thing here, some macro, whatever. Uh, it could, oh, oh, hang on, hang on. Um, huh. we're, we're actually adding this here, underscore start 64 um, to this thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess this is the current program counter value or something. Well, it's it's high part. So, you know, it's, uh, it's just a twofold thing. So there's a high part and a low part. Uh, the one that you can see here and whatever is in register 1b um oh sorry no that is not a register that's actually oh that is a number i'm not sure if this is a hex value or something or whatever 1b is I, I would need to look that up i'm not that much uh familiar with the assembly part here anyway uh it's writing uh the t1 value then also to the T0 uh, memory. Okay, that would be here. Okay, so we store the program counter in a second place. Well, that's enabling the clock, taking the T0 out of the reset. I'm just reading the comments here for now. And then it's putting the M0 in reset again. So yeah, D0 is now the second core and M0 is the core that we were currently working with so far. So, you know, we're, we're actually waking up the other core and then we're going ourselves to sleep in the sense. And then it's just jumping uh, somewhere else. I'm not sure what the dot is. Could be like a loop thing, whatever. Anyway, yeah, um, that is essentially how it works. Right, so start 64, the thing that we saw up there, uh, here, that would be here. Oh, now I get it, and 1B. 1b is a label, so 1b now means the next label that is called 1 and b for backward, so that would be this here. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would need to look this up. So, oh, right, so we're actually not st uh, storing the program counter, but we're storing the program counter plus whatever address would be here, and we store it in uh, this place here. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure yet uh, exactly how all of this works, but yeah, it's something basic. Now you see something funny here. Um, you see this here, it's printing an E character. So if you recall this address from the previous, uh, you know, let's say teaser stream, um, this is actually the address of the first um, the first UART. So it's printing an E, I guess for the embedded core. So the, you know, M0 core is like embedded, whatever. Uh, it, so the, the course, the actual name of the core from T hat is E907. So yeah, it makes sense to have this here. And I think there was also some, some other statement here where it's, right, it's printing a C. So C would be the C906 core. So that's the 64-bit core. And that here again is another UART. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Well, an 88, uh, hex 88 offset from the uh, UART space register is the, uh, like the data register for the output. Very simple, actually. So yeah, in, in that way, you know, you, you see when the cores are uh, talking to each other and waking each other up. Cool. So yeah, that is something that we will also be able to implement in, well, I guess very much the same fashion. We can see if we can write most of this in Rust 
but to be honest, I'm not too sure yet. We will have to see a bit. Yeah. I mean, that's here is something we should also be able to say. So, um, I think this here is like the global thing. So, if we say, uh, hang on, uh, let me check something first. Take D0 out of reset. It's talking to this here. We put ourselves to sleep. We can actually try this out right now, right? We can just put ourselves to sleep. So let's actually do that um, for the fun of it. Uh, so after this sleep here, let's do that. Let's say GLB. And now let's figure out what this here is actually. So we're uh, four, five, four, uh, 548 off uh, from the base register here. How do we figure this out? We look at the documentation of the crate and let me zoom in a bit here. Uh, we're now going to look for GLB. GLB is here. Now, uh, that is a lot of code. Um, can we look at this without expansion? Is there something here? Right. GLB. So we're looking for the register block and we're looking at offset. What was it? Uh, this year. We're looking for offset 548. Let's search for 548. Do we find this? No. Um, huh. That is not in this space here. Interesting. Um, maybe it's actually something else. Oh, but look, there is a chip information register. Oh, we can read that out at some point. Um, well, maybe that would be interesting to print actually, right? So we can we can put this here after risk five platform info, just because it's interesting. Uh, chip information register dot read. And what does that give us? Um, nothing special, I guess. Huh. Let's look at the documentation again. So uh, GLB chip info. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, uh, we're actually currently looking at the source code and not the um, not the documentation thing itself. So let's actually uh, go back here documentation there so yeah this is what we actually want to look at so we say glb where is chip info chip informate oh look camera configuration so <laughs> i guess not yet uh, documented so we read and uh, what do we get from reading uh this thing here do we get any more semantics oh well yeah, then we just print out whatever we get. So we just say uh, print ln. And now we do a four minute string. So we do this here. And let's see if that, ooh, no method named chip in, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, it's not a method. All right. So do we get another function again? Right. So we get the bits. Now this gives us a value, um, whatever it is. And now let's see if we can do the sleep thing. So yeah, well, let's actually look at the data sheet again, what this here is. So it's the two and then lots of zeros. So we would now need to look at uh, the reference manual again and look at the address mapping. And what do we see? Two, lots of zeros. This year, that is actually the global control register. Interesting. 
So yeah, that was that was correct in my memories. Uh, but for some reason, 548 is not in is not in the crate here. Um, huh. Let's see. So we can uh, we can look at the register block again. Let's, uh, let's duplicate this here. Maybe we just overlooked something. Oh, interesting. Huh. There is this area where it says reserved. And that is from hex 420 to whatever. Then come, oh wait, no, no. This is the camera configuration. And then there is something reserved again. Interesting. Oh wait, no, no, this is still the same thing. So yeah, from 420 to uh, 420 plus 4A0, so that would be 8C0, right? And then here it continues with 8C4. Okay, that makes sense. So we were looking for 5, 4, 8. Well, we will do the following. Um, you will say const uh, whatever. We, we just call it the sleepy register now. It's a uh, uh, use size and it's this here and then 548. And now what we do is instead of GLB, we say uh, core PDR rate volatile and now we say sleepy reg as star mute u32 and now we give it a value so what should the value be um we're, we're setting the second bit um So far, so good. Now the thing is, uh, we actually want to read this out first, right? So, and then just change that one value. So we say, let whatever S, S for CP reg. Uh, now we read volatile, the register first. And then we do an OR. And that's it. Oops, we still need to say s star mute u32. All right, so that should get us into a sleep mode. Let's run this code. Oh, and here we go. It actually just happened as we uh, imagined, right? So yeah, we, we just put ourselves to sleep. All right, nice. Now we can also see what this here actually is. So uh, let's look at the hexadecimal representation and we see it's like 6800000. Interesting. Now it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure about the endianness. It could also be that the 68 should be at the end here. But I guess it's actually right in this order. Yeah, I'm not even sure what this uh, 68 here means. Um, it is just some encoding from Buffalo Lab. Um, yeah, maybe maybe somebody can figure this out. Anyway, yeah, we, we just read out that value. And as you can see here, you know, th there is a bunch of more interesting things that we could do with this SOC now. For example, the, there is this here called a trust zone control register. You know, it also has some support for, uh, you know, some encryption technologies. Um, these E-fuses up here for a secure boot mechanism or something. 
yeah, it's something interesting to look into. But yeah, that's for another day. So yeah, let's uh, wrap this up again. Uh, yeah, with a final look at this year. So yeah, today we just um, you know worked uh, with this board. This is the Cypheed M1S dock, and well, I actually have it here resting in a very nice case. And we were talking to this UART up here, and we were printing out some information from the chip, and we were using two UARTs in parallel. One for you know just giving us some debug output that was an asterisk, and the other one for reading out some more information. Well. And then we tried the mechanism to just put our own core to sleep. So yeah, next time we will see about waking up the other core. And well, in order for that to be meaningful, we will actually also need to write some code for it. Anyway, until then, take care and goodbye.